first thing I want to do is thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here today. And the second thing I really need to do is to acknowledge my uh, uh, partner in this particular crime, Dr. Dale Roseboom at Michigan State University. I'm not sure if it's a case of I wouldn't be here without him or if he would have to be here if I wasn't. Let me move on here and, and say that when we were asked to speak at this conference here in, in Oklahoma, they kind of suggested that we wander outside the lane a little bit and think about uh, provides you know, a program that looks at composting in terms of how could we end up with a product uh, that has the greatest nutrient or other value. Um, and basically where we ended up in this discussion or in this thought process was a, we're going to maximize our nutrient conservation, or, or perhaps a better way to put it is to decrease our nutrient loss and thereby our potential environmental impact. And then we're going to talk thought about talking about uh, the possibility that we could influence that nutrient value and environmental impact uh, through how we manage the process of composting. Um, First thing I want to point out is that there are a couple of different concepts out there uh, or, or approaches to the composting process itself. First is, is sort of what, what we're going to call here a minimal management approach. And that's, to a certain extent, what has already been described here. You, you construct your pile, you put your carcass in it, and then you, you finish your pile, and then it sits. Um, in some cases, if you read some of the material out there, you're going to be talking about you're going to aerate it the first time at nine months. Uh, you will sometimes have these piles, depending upon how well they were constructed and how they were managed, sitting there for, for very long periods of time. So we go from an initial situation where we have a lot of active aerobic uh, composting going on to very slowly we, we drop off and it becomes much more anaerobic uh, function in, within the pile. Um, ultimately, we have what we use or what we talk about in use in Michigan anyway is, is what we'll call for our purposes here an intensively managed composting process. This is where we're sort of trying to maximize that period of real active composition or, or composting when, when we're using up a lot of uh, uh, oxygen, uh, we're, we're releasing CO2 and water and heat and, and creating humus from, from that. This is where our temperature is going to be uh, at somewhere between 120, 150 degrees, and we're trying to hold it there. Um, basically, the way we, we function, or the way we operate in heat Michigan, the standard that we use, we say that when the temperature in the pile drops to about 100 degrees for a week or so, and this can be, as one of the earlier speakers put it, or showed us, it can be impacted by weather, rain. Um, that's the point at which you, you will uh, enter the pile. So once you aerate that pile, uh, that whole cycle begins again, and, and you support that high temperature. In Michigan, our carpet composting standard requires that you do this at least three times. Um, what this does is <clears throat> it, increase, it shortens, I should say, the period of time in which the uh, 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 decomposition of the, the carcass or the degradation of the carcass takes place. And at the end, if you're doing it well and you have good composting material, you're managing it well, at six months, seven months, you can actually deconstruct the pile, let the material go on, or the compost uh, amendments go on to a new pile, or field apply them. If you have any bones or, or a piece of hide that's still there, they can go into the next compost pile. Um, and then, of course, it, it's uh, followed by a, a curing period. Uh, move on. There we are. So how do you get in this situation where you have high quality, very active uh, uh, composting going on, and, and even within the lower maintenance piles or lower management piles, how do we extend that over a longer period of time? The way you do that is by having your, your amendments that you're building the pile from be materials that are going to compost very well all on their own, even without the, the, the animal carcass in the pile. And the way we're going to suggest to do that is go to the website that's right there on the page and download the Spartan Compost Recipe Optimizer. Um, this is an Excel uh, spreadsheet uses the solver add-in to, to make it function. It's basically a least cost recipe setup. 
very much like a ration balancer. Um, within this, this uh, uh, piece of, of software, we have constraints on, on things like moisture and, and uh, carbon and nitrogen ratio that are default, but you can also adjust them. Uh, we also have a, a set of amendments within a library to use, but you can also adjust the, the, what those amendments or the profiles of those amendments. You can even add your own amendments if, if that's what you want to do. Um, I'm going to go very, very quickly through it just so you can see how it operates. Um, there's very good instructions attached to it if you go and download it. So I, I give you, you know, suggest you, you look at it anyway. First thing you do when you run the optimizer, that first column there, the spreadsheet, you're going to click into, into each one of those uh, uh, pull-down lists, and that will take you right to the, to the list of amendments, and you put in whichever amendments you might be using or, or might have available. You'll notice that the top one is, is a sheep carcass. Um, there's all the different animal species carcasses in there with, with the information that goes along with them. Uh, when you choose each one of those, it gives you a moisture content, a, a carbon and nitrogen ratio, bulk density. It also gives you a, a default value. You can change all those. Anytime you see that light green there, that's something that you can change within the, 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 the spreadsheet. Oh, darn it There we are. Uh, next, we go on in, in uh, the next section. You can see we've already got our information in here. This is where we set our constraint values for each of the, the composting or the amendment material. Uh, we can either force things in like I did with the sheep carcass here. I said we're going to use an equal constraint and force in 1,000 pounds of sheep cartridge uh, or carcass. Uh, and then we can use the range constraint and let the, the software choose the best uh, range uh, for each one of the other ones. Very simple to do. You can adjust that on the fly and, and go back and, and change it however you want. The next thing you do is put in the performance constraints, and this is what is going to con help control how well the, this mixture of material, this blend, is going to compost. Um, you can control the, the, the or target the moisture content, the carbon and nitrogen ratio, and the bulk density. In this case, I decided not to, to use the bulk density so we didn't uh, uh, have any constraints on that. The other two I just put in a range constraint and, and tried to hit the sweet spot. You also notice at the bottom that it says we have a bucket, loader bucket, the information we need to put in. This is because one of the outputs from this software is a sheet that you're going to hand to the guy in the loader that says um, you're going to have X number of bucket loads of, of this ingredient, X number of bucket loads of that ingredient, and basically gives him the recipe for mixing this blend. The last piece that we do with this is just about the last piece. Uh, you go hit that little green button over on the side that's kind of cut in half says optimize the compost mix. Um, and it gives you the information that's in the second column of, of that piece of the spreadsheet. And that's, it's gone through and optimized the, the, the mixture. It also gives you the, the totals for everything, including the uh, cost total dollars if, if you've input information and you're doing that on the cost basis. It also gives you the opportunity to compare your mixture to the inputs or the constraints that you put in. You'll notice that in this particular case, it says we've got a, a moisture percentage of 66.9. Uh, so it comes back with a recommendation that you should lower your moisture your moisture uh, content and, and so you can go back up and make those changes. The other thing we're down at the bottom of says animal tissue density. It says 1.7 pounds per cubic yard. Um, that's going to be kind of low. Normally, with, with carcass composting, you're going to be somewhere happy in the in the 10 pound per, per square foot or per cubic foot area. The reason that happens is because you'll notice I forced in 10,000 pounds of cow manure or horse manure, um, and that was just so that we get some some numbers to talk about. You can go back and change that however you want to want to work it. And then finally, um, we've got the library materials. There's a library of 100. 30, I believe, uh, give or take, uh, ingredients or materials that you might use in your compost file. But again, if you've got something that isn't on that list, all you got to do is send a sample out to a lab, get the profile for it, and the instructions are right there to, to add it into the, into the library. So this makes a very easy way for you to, to blend or create a nice composting blend. The other spreadsheet that, that you're going to be able to download from that website is actually a compost system planner. It goes in and asks you what, what species you have, 
what age of animals you have, what their weight is, um, how you're managing them in terms of turning them around on the farm, uh, what the mortality rate is. You're going to tell it whether you're using windrows or bins or piles. It's going to come back, and, and also the size of those, and then it's going to come back and give you estimates of how much um, uh, uh, bulking materials and amendments you're going to need. It'll give you the footprint for your windrows or your piles and how much space you're going to require. So what that's going to do is help you build uh, or design your system to your composting system. So let me get away from this and jump back to where we were when talking about nutrients. The, the uh, first location that, that we're going to talk about real quickly on, on retaining nutrients in the piles is runoff and leaching. Anytime you've got water or, or moisture coming down through the pile, you start to carry nutrients with if it gets to that pad surface. If the pad is not permeable, it goes into the soil and you've lost nutrients into the soil. Um, then you've got a contamination problem. If you've got an impermeable surface and it leaves the, the pile itself, you've got a runoff problem and you're losing those nutrients. And those nutrients have both uh, crop value per se as well as potentially if you're selling compost, uh, if you're allowed to do that where you are, you, you potentially are losing fertilizer value that you could be marketing. Um, so how do you avoid this? A, and not composting on, on soil, but sometimes that's unavoidable or, or, or viable even. In which case, you're going to look at maximizing that layer of material that's underneath the carcass, that's underneath the pile. Uh, that way, when the, the, the room of the cow opens up, it captures all that liquid uh, rather than letting it get to the ground. And then you're going to manage your compost system uh, and, and how you manage it to either capture moisture or to shed moisture, depending upon what part of the country you're in and what you're trying to accomplish uh, with your product. The other methodology that we're looking at or thought about uh, in terms of conserving nutrients would be nutrients that would be lost to gaseous emissions. Uh, you got to remember that composting, composting particularly that that highly active composting is a, is a uh, produces heat, it produces water, it produces CO2 mainly, uh, but in the end, it's going to produce also varying amounts of, of methane, of nitric oxide, uh, and, and ammonia. And so we think that these can that this can be mediated a little bit uh, by how you're managing the compost and how you're building your pile. So let's look at that a little bit. This is a piece of research that Dr. Roseboom did that meets our needs for information and we can use it, but it wasn't designed specifically for this purpose. So it's, it's not ideal. Um, what we had was a situation where they had uh, composting going on at the Michigan State Animal Air Quality Research Facility where they've got eight rooms that you can seal and then collect the, the air and then they determine what gases are in the air. Uh, this is originally designed for, for nutritional studies where you, you put the animal in, you feed it a diet, and then you collect the resulting emissions so you can manage the diet to reduce the emissions. Um, in, in this case, we had two periods where they collected emissions and temperatures. Um, we had a 20-day period at the beginning uh, where they collected that. Then they had a 45-day period where they took all the, the materials out of the building, let it sit for 45 days and then brought it back and then at that point for another 15 days they collected uh, temperatures and, and emissions again. I um, want to say that, that half of these uh, samples, eight rooms, had in vitro composting units or in vessel composting units in them for the first phase and, and during the first phase the other four had open static piles and then in the second phase everything was an open static pile in, in each of the rooms. Okay, I also want to point out that they use a blend uh, of materials to, to be their compost amendments, and, and they balanced it so it would be relatively optimal for what they were trying to do. So let's jump into the numbers. Here's temperatures for both the first and second phase. There's first phase on the left. Um, you'll notice that there are basically two sets of, of temperature lines. Um, the one that's both up high and then sort of drifts off to a lower temperature. Those are the open static piles. The ones that the other ones that kind of rise and then stay relatively speaking steady temperatures all through the phase. Uh, those are the in vessel composting systems. And if you think about that, that makes a certain amount of sense. Um, for the open static piles, as the temperature drops, 
or as, as oxygen was used up in the fall, things began to be a little bit more anaerobic over time, so the temperature began to drop. Um, in the second phase where they collected temperatures, you also notice that in general there are two sets of lines. The higher temperature line are the open static piles, or the, ones, the, the, the samples that were originally open static piles in the first um, phase. So what this maybe is suggesting to us is that there's a different amount of uh, maturity for the two different methodologies. And that was borne out uh, if you looked at the, the material, the animal tissue coming out of the, the, these two units, or these two methodologies, the individual or in vessel composting um, were much, much more degraded than were the open static piles. Let's move on to the gaseous emissions themselves. In this case, the blue bars are the first phase, red bars are the second phase. IV is in vessel, OSD is open static pile, G is, is bound up, hog, double to the whole hog. So you can all right there. Um, so what we have is, in the case of ammonia, a very high level of ammonia in vessel composting. If you think about that, that makes a fair amount of sense. Very high energy composting going on there throughout that whole first phase. Um, in terms of methane, uh, the open static piles provided much of the meth a great deal of methane during the first phase. And of course that um, is, is logical when you consider that we're moving into a, a much more uh, anaerobic period as, as time goes on in that first phase. When we get to the nitric oxide, um, those negative numbers that you see on the left for the index of composting, when you apply the statistics to it, basically they end up saying that um, essentially the, the emissions were zero. Um, and, and so what we, when we look at it, we see the open static piles end up being, uh, providing much, much, uh, a great deal of, of nitric oxide uh, during both of these periods. So, why is all important. Well, if we think that climate change is important and we're going to, to manage that on farms and, and work with it, this becomes important for, for composting as well. Um, if you consider when we look at, at greenhouse gases, um, we consider them from the perspective of, of carbon dioxide equivalents. And so the carbon dioxide equivalent for methane and nitric oxide end up being 65 times as powerful in the case of, of, of uh, methane than carbon itself per unit, and 310 times more powerful for nitric oxide. So this is something that we may want to consider. Also, if you think about ammonia and the oxide, both of these are nitrogen, which we want to hold in the pile. Um, so to tie this up a little bit to this piece of research, what we can conclude can conclude here is that the total emission during that very first weeks of, of composting in phase one, the industrial composting system were much, much, or had a lot of emissions. Um, when you look at the open site piles, you can clearly see that there were um, periods of, of that active composting or passive management as well as the active management. There's things going on there. Um, no biofilter over the open Pile. So what would happen if there was biofilter here? Uh, what would the results have been? Um, clearly there was maturity between the two methods. And then the emissions during the entire composting process remain to be seen. We haven't been able to find anybody who's actually followed it for all these different gases. If we push this a little farther, go look at some of the literature out there. Here's a literature review where they were looking at methane avoidance from composting as well as from uh, uh, landfills, they determined from the that's out there, the literature that's out there, that having a, uh, a, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30 to greater than 30 to 1, covering the piles with fixed compost, i.e. having a biofilter on it, and, and then having more content less than 55% would minimize the, the, the production of methane or the emission of methane from the composting and landfills. So 
that fits right in sort of the sweet spot for compost. So you can see that there's opportunities here. Um, and kind of pull it all together, get out of your hair here. Our final conclusion is that, yes, there's a fertilizer value to animal tissue compost, and, and um, that may be taken advantage of at some point. We have uh, composters here in Michigan who are selling to greenhouses and to organic farms, and if they could increase their, their value, fertilizer value, they might be able to buy a few more, uh, uh, a little bit more value out of that. Um, and in order to do that and hold that value in, we need to be able to retain nutrients. The first step in that is formulating the correct recipe, per se, uh, so that we have that nice, high sustained rate of decomposition uh, going on so we can shorten the overall composting process. Um, then we want to prevent leaching so we're retaining uh, nutrients in the pile, and then we want to minimize aerosolization of those nutrients uh, during the composting process itself. So that's basically what we ended up talking at, and, and this is an area that people are really looking at right now. So there isn't a lot of data. So we thought it was kind of an interesting thing to talk about uh, for this conference.